Um, welcome to this IIEA webinar. My name is Catherine Meenan and I'm chair of the Germany Group. And it's a great pleasure for us today to be joined by Catherine Kluver Ashbrook, who's the director and CEO of the German Council on Foreign Relations. And she's she's very under a lot of pressure at the moment in the process of moving from, from the States to Berlin, but she has very generously agreed to speak to us today. Just on the housekeeping, she'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we move into discussion. Uh, both her talk and the question and answer with the audience will be on the record. Uh, you'll be able to join the discussion using the question and answer, answer function on Zoom, which as everybody knows by now, you, from, it will be on your screen. Uh, please send in your questions throughout the event and please identify yourself and your affiliation if there is one. Uh, please join in on Twitter too with the hashtag um, IIEA. So we're very happy to have Catherine here today. She's director and CEO of the German Council on Foreign Relations, the DGAP. For over a decade, she served as executive director of the Future of Diplomacy project at the Harvard Kennedy School. And before that, she was a member of the management board of the European Policy Center and worked as a consultant and senior journalist at, Ro at Roland Berger Strategy Consultants, having begun her career as a TV journalist at CNN International. So Catherine, we're looking forward to this very much and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Catherine. It is such a pleasure to be with you even virtually in Dublin. Uh, I was just saying in our earlier green room conversation how much uh, I would prefer to be frankly with you physically in Dublin and having this conversation uh, on what I consider sacred ground in Ireland, uh, where I had a very formative time of my, my own youth. So, Thank you to the Institute of uh, International and European Affairs. Thank you to you, Catherine, to Michael Collins, to Emily Binchy uh, for putting this entire seminar together. And I really look forward to this conversation. So as Catherine mentioned, it's true. I've been not only leading a transatlantic life uh, in my own sort of genetic makeup, I'm the product of a transatlantic marriage, but more recently I am moving myself, my family, my career back to Germany uh, after 13 years. And in so doing, I did something that many of us might do. You stop off at your parental homestead, which to many a political scientist becomes the storage and repository of your many intellectual thinkings and your many intellectual papers. And in, in that process, I found what clearly in 1997, I found to be a prized possession. It was an issue of Foreign Affairs Magazine published by the Council on Foreign Relations in New York with the grand title right on the cover, Life After Coal Will Always Have Germany. And I bring this up because I of course thumbed this issue because we are again, at an inflection point in German contemporary history. Uh, when this article was published in 1997, we assumed that Helmut Kohl would be the longest serving chancellor in German history. And yet, as sort of recent history shows us, because the chancellor remains in place in situ until a new government is formed, and as we know about German coalition agreements, they take a while to come into fruition, it is more likely that Angela Merkel will end up outlasting politically the man who was her mentor, who brought her into politics, but then who she, and we can talk about this probably in honest terms, in almost a Judean Judas kind of uh, coup uh, sort of laid bare in front of his party uh, in, the, in the later 90s. So an interesting political dynamic there, but I thought it might be interesting to begin with the comparison of these two leaders, because I do think that it says something about the political and foreign policy DNA uh, of my native country. And I think it says something or it helps us understand what we might expect as we move into what I consider to be a new era in German foreign policy. Because as much as the, both of these figures uh, symbolize a certain stability uh, of the German political class, nobody stays around for 16 plus years, if that is not something that a country desires, uh, and a constitutional system allows, if, if it were not a hallmark of something deeper within how a country positions itself, thinks of itself in the world. And yet I don't have to tell you at the IIEA how much the world has changed 
not least over this past decade, the rapid catalyzing effects of how global competition plays out over the shores of Europe, uh, how critical issues of transnational challenges, frankly, uh, impact the way that we view the blurring of lines between domestic and foreign policy. And then the question becomes, is this country, is Germany, with its desire to feel that sort of stability, that couching, that protection adequately prepared for what the Munich Security, Call, Munich Security Conference has referred to as a Zeitenwende, a fundamental time of change. They called Helmut Kohl the, his eternality. And uh, when you look at Angela Merkel and what she has been able to achieve, and again, um, I don't need to remind you, she was seen as certainly during these last four fraught years for the transatlantic relationship, the leader, the undeniable leader of the West. Was she seen as such because of the policies that she put forward and the strength of line that she held uh, respected to Western values? Yes, certainly up to a point, but also again, because of her longevity and because of her consistency, frankly. She was seen, she's seen, you know, by, by uh, Forbes magazine as the most influential, most powerful person in the world. The leader of the free world was sort of a moniker that she never fully embraced. But where does it leave the country at this very moment? It's an interesting time to think of also the domestic policy context in relation to foreign policy. What brought down ultimately or what weakened the legacy of Helmut Kohl were a number of internal challenges, economic challenges that the country had not tackled for years, that he had sort of kept uh, steadily under the rug. And we find a Germany that although it has prospered enormously since the critical moment of the financial crisis in 2008, um, and again, it is, you know, among the lead export nations in the world. We know that Germany sees itself as the export champion of the world, but with US, the United States and China, it is among the biggest trading powers, individual trading powers to say nothing of the power that the European Union brings to the trading, to the global trading floor. It has been able to profit uh, enormously, unlike almost any other country in the world of its sort of middle power standing from that dual security blanket, if you will, embedded deeply in a multilateralist institutional framing of globalization and of course by the American security umbrella provided through NATO. And we know the criticism of German uh, attitudes toward particularly and commitment to particularly uh, the sort of the NATO alliance, its lack of living up fully to the NATO 2% commitments made at the NATO uh, summit in Wales. Now, again, that's something that has improved over the tenure of Angela Merkel, but has it improved because of this particular chancellor? Have attitudes shifted within Europe and within Germany to understand the greater degree to which Europe needs to present itself with a, well, some say sovereign, but at least distinct voice? on the international stage. And that's what I would posit as a question. So you had in these two leaders and have in these two leaders, people who were able to push out uh, sort of dissent within own party ranks within the sort of political uh, climate and the party political dynamic. You saw that both with Cole and even more so with Angela Merkel. It, her domestic standing and her capacity to retain this sort of unfettered leadership position have been attributed to various personal capacities uh, over, the, over the years, but she has been rather ruthless at suppressing the opposition within her own party and conversely usurping like few other German politicians, certainly of her generation, but also historically, uh, effectively, those points that from the opposition, and you'll remember that she has governed in a grand coalition uh, for decades now, uh, that have fundamentally weakened and forced into, um, well, almost a position of atrophy, the other large German People's Party in the country, which is to say the Social Democratic Party. And yet, if you look just at the domestic numbers of what we might see in September, Merkel's legacy is tainted by the outcome of her own policies. 
if you trust the polling, and of course the Germans are very <laughs> closely monitoring the polling ahead of the September 26th election, we have what a thing called the Sonntagsfrage, the Sunday question. If the election were on Sunday, how would you cast your vote? The C Christian Democratic Union has its worst result or brings home its worst result historically in the history of the party hovering somewhere around between 26 and 28 percent. And in 2017, already the last uh, federal election where you'll recall Merkel ran reluctantly in part because President Obama pushed her to uh, as a stalwart figure of the West, um, brought home a result of only 33 percent. And already that said something about her capacity to move this country forward, which is to say her lack ultimately of capacity of addressing the deep internal issues that will, would make Germany more resilient, a larger and more capable player internationally, and certainly uh, you know, with deeper, deeper reaching reforms within the country that are needed, but that she consistently shied away from. So her capacity, and this again is a continuation of Cole, is to read a situation, and I, you see I'm making the Merkel hand gesture, it comes almost naturally in that moment, to, see, to wait out a situation, to read the political tea leaves. Uh, so even critical decisions uh, like the, uh, the decision to open the country to, uh, to migrants in 2015, which was interpreted as a large humanitarian gesture that the country ultimately was not ready from. And that begat a number of internal problems. Think only of the rise, uh, the drastic and frankly catalytic rise of the far right party Alternative für Deutschland. Think only of the issues that it caused communal financing for cities for a number of other things. Now. Did the country ultimately manage in this idea of wir schaffen das? Yes, it did. But she took polling, she read polling strategically, and she felt that this coupled with some of those, those sort of basic tenets of her moral conviction were something that she could put forth to the German public. But again, much like that decision, much like her decisions and her slow decision-making in the Euro crisis in 2008, and some of the hesitancy now in this COVID crisis means that ultimately she can read a situation in the moment, hold the political tension in the moment, but, and I think this is something that is critical for Germany going forward, does not yet, it speaks to sort of a lack of strategic foresight culture in the country. The anticipatory capacities of German foreign policy and of German chancellors in the past historically and today is in fact actually quite low. It's just to say the diagnostic capacity to anticipate the knock-on effects both within the European Union, think again of the dramatic effect that her laggard decision-making in 08 had on inter-European solidarity, on ultimate functionality and recovery, think of the speed or rather the slowness of recovery of the Greek and Italian economies. We're still battling those issues. Look at how she didn't fully, and the country uh, didn't fully embrace the kind of structural reforms within the Eurozone that would have had to come out of the 2008 financial crisis, which means that still now in 2021, we're asking us ourselves, can the Eurozone survive if, in fact, and this is true of the party political programs almost across the board as we look towards September, Germany decides to default back to its constitutional mandate to go back to its attitude of savings, this almost Christian <laughs> attitude and conviction around balanced budgets and what the Germans call die schwarze Null. So what you see in the consistency or what you see is a consistent element between Kohl and Merkel, certainly in their foreign policy um, line is yes, the long conviction and long ties to German chancellors and historic German chancellors with long uh, serving terms before them, which is yes, a commitment to the anchoring in the transatlantic relationship and what Konrad Adenauer termed as Westbindung. Yes, their own interpretation uh, of what Willy Brandt's Ostpolitik would mean in a modern context. So the positioning of themselves, both Kohl and Merkel, as the main interlocutors toward the 
key figures in the Soviet Union. In Cole's case, the, he and Gorbachev, of course, critical for the reunification, that relationship critical for the reunification of Germany. Merkel, frankly, the only leader capable of holding Putin's feet to the fire. But then again, to what degree? Because Nord Stream 2 is still very much a project that the chancellor has fealty to and that those who are in this governing coalition have fealty to. So you see an, in a, a sort of a, an ability to address the issues, but only at the last minute and to fail to give to the German people, but also to the political elite an idea of long-term strategic ideas, political foresight, and sort of anticipatory action. You might ask if that's part and parcel of European or of, of German political DNA. I don't think so. I think in that sense, you have had, you've, the German people have been fault or insufficiently served by their political leadership uh, to look at the critical challenges that are coming at Germany uh, in the next few years. And I mean, what are they? We obviously are looking very closely at the electoral uh, calendar, not only in Germany, but in France. France, you have an embattled uh, president in Emmanuel Macron who put forth, frankly, quite provocative ideas on the future of Europe. Think only at his speech in Aachen and in other places to say, look, we need to rethink the European project from the ground up. Was he met by the chancellor in the sort of classical European tandem structure? No, he was not. For that, the chancellor is far too cautious and she is far too tied by the purse strings uh, that are dictate, dictat, if you will, of the German economic model. Uh, look at China. Uh, she said she avowed, uh, of course, that uh, Germany would take a harder stance on human rights issues, on Hong Kong, on Xinjiang. And yet at the tail end of the German presidency of the, German, uh, of the European Council, it was, it was Angela Merkel who took the lead in bringing home the Chinese uh, investment agreement, which is now so embattled, frankly, rightly, uh, for all of the, not only the fine print in the latter parts of the intellectual control agreements that the Chinese snuck into this deal, but also in their functionality and what it might do to the integrity of the European economic system and model. Look at Russia. She was willing and able to push the Ukraine format through, or push uh, issues on Ukraine through the Normandy format uh, in a way. And you remember visually how she led um, <laughs> the, 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 the delegation, the negotiation delegation out of that uh, initial negotiation room around Minsk one. And yet uh, the situation in Ukraine continues to be just as dire, if not more so, in this sort of prolonged frozen conflict that Russia uses for its strategic and uh, tactical um, advantage. So there are a number of key issues, and I already mentioned the Eurozone. If France goes another way, if we have a French election that either weakens the political situation of Emmanuel Macron such that it binds him in to in, in action uh, and political inability in France, then what of the partnership that has so long driven the future of the European Union? If in fact, as the party political programs map out, Germany insists on by 2023, rolling back some of the innovative financial capacities embedded in the European um, reform and rescue package among COVID, what does that do to, again, the internal solidarity, the integrity and functionality, and frankly, the innovative capacities that a European Union needs and that the American president called for in his four-day summitry here in, 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 uh, on the continental, uh, in continental Europe and in the UK. What happens of, you know, what, what, can, what might happen to German industry going forward if it's two, three of its key industries are so bound, in fact, codependent on the Chinese economy. What does that say about the robustness of the German economic model? When in fact, you know, if you take things like machine building, still a key industry uh, within the German economic context, uh, the Chinese overtake German capacities very quickly. Is in fact, German economy, is in fact the economic system prepared to accept the blow that China could very easily deal 
uh, to what is still now a codependent relationship. I think there is a very marked danger for what Angela Merkel, what Helmut Kohl, and what traditional conservative German chancellors have tried to protect, which is to say, insulate the country from these global shocks. I think that is no more. And these shocks could come quickly and they could come apace, uh, frankly, over the next roughly five years. And this is where I, I'll, I'll, I'll get to my concluding points because we can talk about details in a second, where I'm concerned when I read the party political programs uh, of the leading candidates and uh, parties in the race for this election uh, on September 26. Merkel's largely grandest failure, frankly, is her inability to cultivate, mentor, uh, and bring along a successor, not only in her model, but someone who is frankly able to see the challenges that Germany faces and transmit those in a functional, responsible way to the population. The party, the CDU, the conservatives, and the Christian Socialist Union, their sister party, did themselves no favors uh, toward the latter part of the pandemic when it came to the real, when the rubber hit the road, as we say, or the syringes had to hit the arms uh, in the execution of, um, of the uh, immunization campaign, but also uh, a number of grift scandals within the party exposed the fact that this stalwart protectiveness uh, around the party and around German uh, political and economic function had led to, well, frankly, greedy overreach. And we can talk about that scandal and the impact it had on the party. You then had very public infighting between the two candidates running to succeed her after over the past years, either people had vacated the possibility of that slot. Think of AKK, Annegret kram karrenbauer the current um, Minister of Defense had pulled back because of their, well, fear, frankly, of that kind of responsibility, or had been taken out of the running by Merkel's cunning work uh, within the party. And then on the other hand, you don't have sufficiently an opposition, at least not in the traditional sense, uh, because of course this grand coalition has ruled for, frankly, far too long, where a discernible or strong uh, opposition policy line is visible. And that leads us to very quickly, uh, the role of the Green Party, who might very well be the kingmaker in this election in September. And where in fact, I do see a number of new impulses uh, coming out because there is a much stronger line coming out of the Green Party and their young candidate, Annalena Baerbock, uh, Baerbock who is 40 years old and uh, frankly embattled in, in what might in British politics, we would just term as a, frankly, a smear campaign, a sequential smear campaign by other components uh, of the political system, which shows the degree to which sort of the more stalwart, stolid partners uh, or parties in the German political system see a new approach as a danger to the status quo, when in fact, and I'll say this again, the status quo in German politics no longer and can no longer exist because of the demands uh, upon the country moving into this next decade. She has made clear that her party is willing and able, well, committed to taking a new stance on Russia, on China, and finding more compatible ways of concretely working and financially investing in a transatlantic relationship and in a different form of military and capacity building uh, components within NATO. And that is truly something to watch because that will give, that will offer up some friction in the coalition negotiations, which will likely, if you again believe the polling that we're looking at now, uh, take place between the Green Party and the Christian Democratic Christian Socialist Union come September 27th. Uh, and so there are new impulses in German foreign policy. There are, there is some new thinking. The question is whether or not the strength of the German DNA, its inability to think strategically in a more nimble, foresighted way to bring along the domestic political dialogue will hamper the kind of quick progress that Germany truly needs because, and I say this to all of my fellow German citizens, uh, not only does Europe need Germany's intellectual strategic foreign political foresight, but it also needs its financial capacity, strength, and commitment. 
And if you think back to the Munich Security Conference of 2014, where German lead politicians formulated what was the call then dubbed the Munich Consensus, which is that Germany needed a new, a rethought process of German international responsibility. That is what I think of, that is what we think of at the German Council on Foreign Relations when it comes to German uh, foreign policy responsibility. It's both the ability to set a strategic tone, to know what tactics are usable in tandem with the United States and in looking very critically into the world and using tactic strengths that Germany has in its ability to sequence its diplomacy and force the hand of others. Because let's remember negotiation is getting the other side to have it your way, which Germany is capable and should be capable of doing. And then frankly, paying for it because the moment is too critical, it's too pertinent and it's too ripe for Germany to consider to do, to consider moving on the way that it has under or had under these two long serving uh, conservative chancellors, which is stolid, middle ground, immovable and stable. Stability is no more, changes everywhere, changes now. And so it's an exciting time to watch German politics. I really look forward to your questions. We can lean into any of the specific ideas, party programs, Merkel's legacy, whatever's on your mind, I'm here for you. But thank you for being here and thank you for paying attention to what will be an exciting, a challenging uh, and a demanding time for German foreign policy.